The Indianapolis 500 is the largest single-day spectator sporting event in the world. Over 300,000 people from all across America and around the world converge on the two-and-a-half-mile oval on the west side of Indianapolis in the aptly named town of Speedway. Many people attend the race each year for the first time. Some make the trip an annual tradition, while others cross the race off their racing bucket list. No matter what the situation, there are always questions about going to the race for the first time. Getting to Indianapolis, figuring out where to stay, where to sit, getting to the track, and what to do in the days leading up to the race, and all of the various happenings can be a bit overwhelming for a new visitor to the greatest spectacle in racing. That's where this video comes in. I'm Christopher DeHarty, and here's a first-timer's guide to attending the Indianapolis 500. A quick note. This video is not sponsored or endorsed by IndyCar, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Penske Entertainment, or any of its subsidiaries. Void where prohibited, limited time offer while supplies last, no purchase necessary, no substitutions, exchanges, or refunds. Your mileage may vary, no rights reserved, valid at all participating locations only. Use is directed, not for resale, slippery when wet, some assembly required. If this medical condition lasts longer than four hours, seek immediate medical attention. Do not pass code, do not collect $200. I think that about covers everything. Now let's talk about getting to Indianapolis in the first place. If you live in any of the states surrounding Indiana, driving to Indy is probably your best bet. From further out, flying is an option with running a car becoming an essential, but there are other options to consider. If rental car prices or availability are a worry, there are other airports to fly into, but that comes at the cost of having to drive the rest of the way to Indianapolis. Here's a map of Indiana and its surrounding states. Chicago in the northwest is three hours away from Indianapolis, with two airports in the city, O'Hare and Midway. Detroit is just over four hours away in the northeast. Columbus to the east is just over three hours away from IMS, while Cincinnati and Louisville are both two hours away from their respective locations. St. Louis is just shy of four hours away from IMS, and those are the main airports surrounding Indiana. Here are those airports all listed and their distances to IMS. Feel free to pause here for a few seconds. Some of these highways also have toll roads, so be mindful of that. Once your path to Indianapolis is decided, the next step is figuring out where to stay in Indianapolis or in the surrounding areas. This is a map of Indiana. While many might like to stay in Indianapolis proper or near Interstate 465, that's the loop surrounding the city, nearby towns offer their own charm for travelers in different hotels based on their location. Take note of the different towns on the map and see which hotels you prefer that are in each town. Now that we've gone over lodging options, let's go over seating locations. The main straightaway is on the western side of the track, running directly north to south. The first turn is a southwest turn, the second turn is southeast. Turn 3 is northeast, while turn 4 is northwest. This explains the names of several grandstands, such as the Northeast Vista, Northwest Vista, South Vista, and Southeast Vista. Tickets can be purchased online directly from the Speedway. However, options can be very limited as renewals are very high for tickets. The highest value seats are around turn one, but those seats go to the people with the highest amount of seniority in the IMS ticket system. Those are always renewed. The other turns also offer fantastic vantage points, allowing fans to see large parts of the track. Worth noting, it is impossible to see all of the track from any grandstand seat, so you'll have to find a compromise that works for your individual taste. A new purchaser from IMS will get tickets from either the short shoots or lower on the main straightaway outside of the shade from the overhangs. At the start of the public ticket buying session, the C stand would have some availability, but that gets snatched up pretty quickly. There are usually seats available in H and J stands and in the turns, but the closer you are to the apex, the less likely seats will be available. On the secondary market, tickets are available almost every grandstand, but that's something I don't have any experience with. Let's look at getting to the speedway itself. For the sake of this video, we are going to assume you're staying outside of the 465 loop. If you're staying within the 465 loop, you'll be able to get to the speedway a lot easier, especially if you can find your way to 16th Street. For those staying south of the city, exit 106 on I-65 gets you onto the 465 loop, so pick the lane going westbound. Coming from the east on I-70, that's exit 90. Go south. If you're coming from the east on I-74, Take exit 94 and go southbound. Coming from the north on I-65, that's exit 123, which actually enters the loop from the northwest side, so head southbound. Coming from the west, exit 73 on both interstates 74 and 70 hit the loop. Go north. 
Coming from the northeast on I-69, that's exit 200, go westbound. While mentioning 465, it's worth noting that there is construction on the I-69-465 intersection that will continue until at least 2025. It's also worth bringing up that as of this time of recording, construction is still ongoing on I-65 in downtown Indianapolis as part of the I-65-70 north split. I-70 is open as of time of recording, while construction is still ongoing on I-65, which is scheduled to open in downtown in April 2023. Fingers crossed, folks. To get to the track, there are three main exits on 465 to remember. Exit 17 goes to 38th Street. Several parking lots north of the track are located between 25th and 30th Streets. Park there if you're sitting in the north portion of the speedway. You can purchase parking passes for those lots from IMS when you get your tickets. Exit 16 gets you to Crawfordsville Road. After getting onto Crawfordsville, the parking lots west of the track are accessible after going through a couple of streets near the track. Parking lots south of 16th Street are accessible after going through the roundabout near the speedway. Exit 14 goes to 10th Street, which is further south of the track. There are parking lots between 10th and 16th Streets, but costs vary based on who owns the lot, and almost all of them, or maybe all of them, require a pass from the lot owner. We'll get to everything on race day later on in the video. Now that we've discussed getting to IMS, let's look at everything leading up to the race. In May, IndyCar begins their IMS activity with a road course race on the Saturday two weeks before the Indy 500. If someone wants to spend nearly the whole month of May in Indy, getting to town the Thursday before the Grand Prix would be a good idea. Side note, looking to an extended stay hotel. They can be lifesavers. That Thursday is mostly a test day for the latter series, and it allows the traveler to get their tickets and everything in the main administration building outside of turn number one. While many get their standard tickets that allow access to the grounds, some might look for more access to the garage area. That's where a bronze badge comes into play. This $150 badge allows the wearer access to the grounds, except on race days, and to the garages. A silver-colored badge of the same design costs $500, allowing the wearer the same access as a bronze badge, plus access to the cold side of pit road behind where the crews work. These usually sell out quick. Before going any further, it is worth noting that with a bronze or silver badge that you are entering a workspace for these teams. Follow the instructions from the Yellow Shirt Security Patrol at all times, and please keep your head on a swivel to look around everywhere. Be alert, folks. After the road course race on Saturday, Sunday gives the track crew time to convert the track from the road course to the oval layout. Barriers are moved, other road course equipment is cleared away, and practice then starts on Tuesday. Practice takes place Tuesday through Friday, with Friday being known as Fast Friday owing to the turbocharger pressure being turned up in the engine so speeds are higher for qualifying weekend. Qualifying takes place on the Saturday and Sunday before the race with a practice session on Monday after qualifying. Several specific sections of grandstands are open during practice and qualifying. If you can, get yourself upstairs in the standee penthouse at least once so you can watch practice high up in turn number one. Worth noting, if there is rain at IMS, the cars cannot practice on the oval. If track activity is rained out for the day, head over to the Hall of Fame Museum located in the infield near turns one and two. The museum moved into this current building in 1976 and has two gift shops just inside the main entrance. This side has die casts of some cool souvenirs. Well, this side of the shop has even more apparel and some reading material and some clearance items from last year and even before that. The museum itself has neat displays set up through the year that changes from time to time. One year was all about the Unter family, one year was all about Rick Mears, one year was all about the record-breaking era at IMS, while 2023 is all about drivers that had a best finish of second in the 500. On the other side of the museum is a large display of winning cars. If track activity is rained out, another place to go would be the Indiana State Fairgrounds to see the cars at the Meekum Car Auction. Lots of great cars are available to look at, including some of the ones pictured here from years ago. The week leading up to race day is where the action picks up. The United States Auto Club, USAC, Sprint Cars start the preliminary racing action with the Holman Classic over at Terre Haute Action Track. 
It's about an hour and 10 minutes southwest of IMS on I-70. In 2023, that race will be on Wednesday, May 24th, but for future years, check USAC's website. Link in the description below. The Friday before the 500 is carb day, the final day of practice where teams do their final checks and setup work before putting the cars away before the race. There's also a pit stop competition with crews testing their skills against each other with the winning crew and driver combination splitting $50,000. Plus, there's a concert in the infield that's pretty neat and it gives everybody a chance to people watch for a little bit. That evening in Brownsburg at Indianapolis Raceway Park is the Carb Night Classic for USAC and the lower levels of the IndyCar Ladder System. USAC will have their payment midgets as well as a 100 lap Silver Crown Series race while both USF 2000 and USF Pro 2000 will race at the .686 mile oval just 10 minutes northwest of IMS just going up Crawfordsville Road. Saturday is Legends Day at IMS with a full field autograph session and a public drivers meeting for spectators to watch in the grandstands right behind the pits. Various contingency awards are presented at this meeting before the drivers are sent downtown to the annual 500 Festival Parade that travels through the streets of Indianapolis. Some people go to the parade every year, while others go only once. This event is worth going to if your future Indy 500 plans are uncertain. If you're looking for even more racing action, head on over to Anderson to see the Little 500 at Anderson Speedway, which is 50 minutes away from IMS going north on I-69. Warning! This race will end near midnight. If you're staying a bit far away, this might not be the best thing for you to do, especially with an early wake-up call coming on Sunday morning. Last but not least is the annual memorabilia show that takes place in the days leading up to race day. Before the pandemic, this was held at the Pagoda Plaza, but in recent years, this has found a new home at the Embassy Suites in Plainfield, just 18 minutes southwest of IMS going down I-70. This event is a must for any first-timer, as you'll find all sorts of cool memorabilia to purchase from many different eras of the sport. It's the world's most fun motorsports flea market, and it is something I visit every year. As a reminder, if you're getting into town early, buy as much of your souvenirs as possible before race day. The less you have to carry on race day, the happier you'll be. Also, buy a program. They're pretty neat and can teach a lot about the race's history. Oh, and don't forget to visit Speedway Indoor Karting. It's in the same building as Brazzini Pizzeria on Main Street, and it's a lot of fun. Let's go over places to eat. For those with a taste for fine dining, St. Elmo's in downtown Indianapolis is perhaps one of the best steakhouses in the country, but it is expensive. If you're looking to eat close to the track, Main Street and Speedway is your best bet, with several restaurants along the two-lane road. My personal favorites are Dawson's on Main, Barbecue and Bourbon, and Big Woods. I've also eaten at Brazzini Pizzeria, Tacos and Tequila, and O'Reilly's Irish Pub, and all three are worth visiting. A legendary establishment on Main Street is Charlie Brown's, which is perhaps the best breakfast spot in town. It closes at 2 o'clock every day, so get there early. Off of Main Street, an absolute must is Mug and Bun. The drive-in on 10th Street is for sale as of this recording, but it should still be operating. So go get a tenderloin and some root beer, because there's no other restaurant like it. If you're looking for a sweet treat, Go to Long's Bakery on 16th Street. It's almost two miles east of the track and the donuts are fantastic. That covers everything leading up to race day, so let's talk about race day itself. It's worth noting that the town of Speedway forbids street parking on race day. Several residents in Speedway sell parking for race fans in their yards, which can be a lifesaver for many. As for getting to the track on race day, there's really only one rule. There's no such thing as getting to the track too early on race day. The earlier, the better, as traffic will be very congested with over 300,000 people converging on the same piece of land. Plus, it's always nice to see all of the pre-race festivities. To get to the track, the routes I mentioned earlier will get you close to the track, but it's worth noting several other roads leading to the speedway, such as Georgetown Road from the north and Lafayette Road that runs northeast of the track. All will be main thoroughfares on race day. Follow the instructions of all the police officers near the track. They will help you get to where you need to go. For those of you staying in downtown Indianapolis, try and investigate if your hotel offers shuttles to and from the race. Just check. Inside the track, there will be many different food vendors. Now every food stand has the same offerings, so take note of that when you're looking for something to eat on race day. Also note that IMS is a cashless facility and has been so since 2020. 
The grandstand boxes are clearly marked with their grandstand name and box number on various signs to help you get to where your seats are. Keep looking around and you'll get to where you need to go. And if you're lost, ask a yellow shirt for help. They're usually pretty good about that. For those with mobility issues, there are six elevators that will take you to the upper deck grandstands. This one was closed due to there not being any track activity, but the elevators are there. They were installed for the 2016 500 as part of Project 100 to give the Speedway a more modern look and to satisfy ADA requirements. There are three other elevators that go to the Hallman Terrace Suites, but that's all they go to. The race will take between two to three hours, so once you're inside the facility, stay there. Afterward, don't bother leaving your seats immediately. There's Victory Lane to enjoy and several post-race ceremonies too. Plus, it's good to let the traffic go ahead of you. That being said, in 2022, there was still a lot of traffic even three to four hours after the race ended, so be mindful of that. As a reminder, with over 300,000 people at the track, don't expect to get to places too quickly. The track will be jammed with people, so be mindful that where you need to go or want to go will take extra time with the crowds. Oh yeah, one more thing. Rain. The race hasn't been rain shortened since 2007 and hasn't been postponed due to rain since 1997, but that doesn't mean it can't happen in the future. Build an extra day in your travel plans if you can in case of rain. If it doesn't rain, go see the World of Outlaws race at Lawrenceburg near Cincinnati on the Monday night after the 500. That's been a traditional stop for them the last few years and the Outlaws are a lot of fun to watch in person. I think that about covers everything about going to the Indianapolis 500. If you took the advice in this video and it helped your trip, let me know in the comments below how your trip went. If a 500 veteran feels I missed something, let me know in the comments below and I might make an addendum video to mention those things. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like and please subscribe to the channel like how every other YouTuber asked you to. Or if you don't want to, I understand. That's your decision and I respect it. I'm Christopher DeHardy and I'll see you at the racetrack or in the next video.